Hello, I'm Hugo Re, and today we're going to be going over growth inhibitors in, and its particular use in uh, transgender youth, particularly adolescents, and uh, in some studies younger. So let's go over a background. Of course, this is a critical uh, perspective. I am criticizing the use of it, and um, if anyone wants to refute this or make any arguments, you can always comment. And if you do make a video that's a response to it, I will put it in the description. I believe that we should have a, you know, a dialogue between the efficacy of this. I'm sure it's not, um, you know, all clear cut. There might be stuff that I don't know. But anyways, I went through 77 studies through PubMed. I searched up growth inhibitor um, transgender because I wanted to see its particular use in transgender youth. So what is uh, gender dysphoria? So that's the diagnosis that people get when they want to transition or they feel like they're transgender. In the DSM-5 TR, which is, um, I believe, the latest version of the DSM, it was released in 2022. It's a very long book. I believe it has 298 diagnoses uh, compared to the DSM-4, which I believe the expansion was only about three, I'm going to guess. And then um, you compare it to um, the DSM-3, which I believe had a, about 100 and... Uh, don't know, but it's between 150 and 200. So there is a market increase when you go from the DSM-3 and beyond that, obviously. The DSM-2 and DSM-1 are, I would say, they're very different because um, it's it's a very different approach they took because when the ICD was there, which is international um, version, I, can't even, I can never remember what this thing stands for, sorry. International Classification of Disease. So DSM, Three was a response to that, essentially, essentially changing it from the multimodal sort of psychoanalysis to an actual, you know, book that's meant to classify diseases. So there is a market increase, which makes all these different disorders, all the novel ones, extremely convoluted. I mean, the number of pages has like quadrupled when you take it in account from, and the reliability has gone down, the validity has gone down of the studies obviously that they used but the funding has not but it might also be because a lot of these studies are you know novel within the last 30 years not saying that some aren't new i would say that uh or some aren't uh, valid i would say there's a new one that's actually being proposed it's called um developmental uh ptsd and or developmental trauma disorder it's actually one that's very cool but that's a side note um and I, I just want to warn people, this is going to be like more of a podcast than it is any uh, formal video. I'm just, but let's go over the diagnostic criteria first. So gender dysphoria in children, because that's what we are focusing on. So I'm not going to go over what it is in adults. So it's A, a marked incongruence between one's experience and expressed gender and assigned gender of at least six months duration as manifested by at least six of the following. One of what? one of which must be criterion A1. One, strong desire to be of the other gender or an instance that one is the other gender or some alternative gender different from one's assigned gender. Two, in boys assigned gender, a strong preference for cross-dressing or simulating female attire or in girls assigned gender, a strong preference for wearing only typical masculine clothing and a strong resistance to the wearing of typical feminine clothing. Three, a strong preference for cross-gender roles in make-belief play or fantasy play. Four, a strong preference for the toys, games, and activities stereotypically used or engaged in by the other gender. Five, a strong preference for playmates of the other gender. Six, in boys assigned gender, a strong rejection of typically masculine toys, games, and activities, and a strong avoidance of rough and tumble play, or in girls assigned gender, a strong rejection of typically feminine toys, games, and activities. 7. A strong dislike of one's sexual anatomy. 8. A strong desire for the primary and or secondary sex characteristics that match one's experienced gender. And then in B. The condition is associated with clinically significant distress or impairment in social school or other important areas of functioning and then you specify if it's with a disorder or difference of sex development for example a congenial 
androgenital disorders such as E25 congenital adrenal hyperplasia or androgen insensitivity, insensitivity syndrome. And the coding note, code the disorder or difference of sex development as well as gender dysphoria. So there's some things to note when we take into this. Obviously, this is one of the things with uh, the reliability and validity when we take into this. So a lot of this, these criteria can really be applied to, um, you know, certain environments, such as we take um, a strong preference for cross-gender cross roles and make-believe play or fantasy play. That can obviously be sexual, and we know that there's um. And then that would also, uh, you know, go over right into the number two, which is a strong preference for cross-dressing or simulating female attire. You know, and not only that, but doesn't that really apply to a lot of what gay actions are? I'm not a gay man, but it does seem like, you know, there tends to be the more feminine gay guy and then the masculine gay guy, and they typically go together. I'm not too versed, but I do live in a area where there's definitely a lot of gays, and there's nothing wrong with it. But um, then you have a strong preference for toys, games, or activities stereotypically used or engaged by the other gender, which is um, you know, if you grew up with a sister or whatever it was, or maybe a toys passed down. You might just want to play with Barbies. I mean, they're just toys. I don't get how that makes you, you know, gender dysphoric. Um, and then another one, a strong desire to be of the other gender or an assistance that one is the other gender. Not only does this, you know, apply to inference, you know what I mean? If someone's telling you maybe your parents are transgender or lesbians or, you know, extreme liberals, let's just say for lack of a better term, you might really be inferred, especially if you're a kid, that you should be this. Or if your teachers are telling you that this is, you know, a thing or that, you know, whatever your race or gender orientation is bad, then you might deviate towards this. Or if you feel gay, you might, you know, question this. Especially when you get children that are, like, you know, raised in a household where, like, you don't have a gender till you decide that you, which one you want to be. I mean, that's kind of, like course that's going to kind of mess with what you uh you know decide later on i would say but not only that but children are um imaginary in nature so you know there might be one day when especially young children that are like five five and younger or even five to ten they believe in santa claus there's a lot of things that um they like that are imaginary they think very differently than adults do i mean i believe that there's um some studies uh, this might be completely wrong but children often hallucinate this might be because of the extreme uh synaptic plasticity of the brain during that age essentially if you look at brain studies it's very cool but you go through a thing synaptogenesis and then you go through pruning which is all these synapses get ruined eventually after birth not ruined but um it's pruning, so the ones that aren't needed get ruined. But that's why you see, you don't want too many, but you want some, basically. That's why you see people with ADHD have less of this, and uh, social media is having an extreme detriment on it. It'll help with your you know, multitasking, but eventually you want some of it. But, um, sorry, I don't even remember what I was making with that. But yeah, kids have that, so they might hallucinate and, you know, they don't have as rational of a logic. I mean, that comes with the prefrontal cortex, with especially in males. That's the last part to be developed. One of the last parts, at least. And it doesn't develop fully until you're 25. So, you know, that's one of the major decision-making um, things or brain areas. Of course, it's a very large area. But, you know, I think it's something worth attending to when we took... And then, um, number seven... A strong dislike of one's sexual anatomy. That's another weird one, right? How many uh, females growing up have an issue with their anatomy? I mean, especially with the role of media, I mean... What I mean is they might look at another female and then think, Oh my god, her um, 
breasts or whatever it is are far bigger and I don't like mine because of that or perhaps the vice versa or they you know they look at these models and whatnot and they think I can't be like that I hate how my anatomy is so I think that's perhaps it might just be the writing of this you know but I think it's horrible that this is a heuristic that we're using you know and uh I get it's supposed to be heuristic and you're supposed to, you know, match it all up. But I think that this can be applied and misapplied and misinterpreted in a lot of cases. And I think this needs to be refined at the very least. If not, we need to really question, hey, what's going on here? But that's a problem with the law of the DSM. So I'm not just picking on gender dysphoria. I have in other papers and whatnot that I've written criticized essentially everything and there's a great um author his name is alan francis and he has a great book called saving normal where he essentially criticizes this um entire ideology that you know why do we have so many things what's the influence of the pharmaceutical industry obviously which is a lot i believe um like every drug essentially gets i believe it was 20 million dollars per year of a advertising cost which is typically double of whatever their R&D is you know and in some cases it's even triple I believe a total of a I'm gonna say 41 million dollars in 2021 I believe might have been 2019 but that was used on just the advertising that doesn't account for how many um that's in obviously America USA but um it is important to consider that because, you know, advertising. And then they also pay for these uh, consultants and, you know, events that, you know, you take someone like Pfizer and they've paid for, I believe, 70% of all psychiatric, um, psychi psych psychiatrists, sorry. You know, it, it, it is um, concerning. And we take into account another thing. Um, the DSM, which is a lot of the guys on the board, were also being paid money by a lot of these pharmaceutical industries and uh, pharmaceutical uh, companies. Sorry, not industries, obviously, but they're being paid, you know, money by that, and it might have played an influence. Whereas the DSM four wasn't open. Any, if you wanted to participate in it, you could really, right? In the how they made the DSM four, whereas the DSM five was closed, so you had to be invited to participate in it, which also raises another thing. That's why Alan Francis, who was one of the chair uh, board, I believe the leading one actually, did make a book on how uh, he didn't believe that it was uh, right what they were doing with the DSM-5. And um, there's also another guy, which Thomas uh, Saz, which I'm not going to get into because I'm still actually reading the book, unfortunately. But he is also another big proponent of the argument that we should not be doing a lot of what we're doing with the, the DSM-5 and the standardization and you know, perhaps the mass diagnosis criteria. Oh, sorry, another thing that I forgot to mention. There's another study I was reading. Um, I, I can't remember it, but essentially you look at the rates of incidence of schizophrenia across um, different uh, countries. And America is like, I believe, 420 plus per 100,000. And, uh, and then, you know, New Zealand was right behind that too. And then you take someone like you take Canada, you take uh, most of the northern part of uh, South America with Brazil, I believe, being the exception and a few of the countries that are surrounding that. And, uh, you know, they're all around 240, 260, whereas, again, America is around 420 plus per 100,000. So, you know, what's the what's the difference? Why are New Zealand and uh, America have such an such a increase in like schizophrenia? across um, the board. That seems really weird. And then um, the difference is, the primary difference, I mean, there might be other differences like herbicide society, or societal expectations, whatever, blah, blah, blah. In politics, I mean, you can really dive into it. There's obviously more causes than just this. But, you know, there's advertising in those two countries. Those are the only two countries in the world where it's legalized to advertise, you know, pharmacological... Uh, agents it's it's insane and then we've seen this with purdue we've seen this with uh, pfizer we've seen this where especially like, how are they allowed to market oxycotton and then they're sending girls to flirt with the uh, 
you know, the psych psychiatrist and the pharmacies and like, hey, that's weird. <laughs> like, and then these girls are getting bonuses depending on how much prescriptions are being sold. That is odd. And they're becoming millionaires. And uh, I don't think much has been done about that. But honestly, it's been scheduled and I don't think there's any, uh, you know, thing. But that's America. There's a lot of things that you can do about that. You know, you should be able to, like, hey, why are you giving out, you know, 50 prescriptions of oxytocin per week? That's odd. Wouldn't be hard to, uh, you know, check that, especially when you have got people's uh, lives on the line. You know, I believe in uh, autonomy, but goddamn, that's a profession. That's, uh, you know, you're towing the line there. Anyways, let's get into the studies now. Sorry, actually, I should uh, go into the background of transgender is it like a new thing is a question that i really had of course um or i at least want to propose in the background and um obviously no it's not a new thing it's been throughout history there's a marked uh, incidence of it or at least what it is has changed you know of course we had the indigenous people of uh, canada and america and they had a thing called a uh, two-spirit where i guess they were sort of both it was an androgynous sort of role and we've seen the androgynous role. I mean, Jung had a thing for it. It was called uh, the anima and the animus, which is your inner conflict of your male side and your female side. And um, so this idea of androgynous people is not new, I believe. If you look at, you know, all the different cultures, you can go into Jung and Eric Newman and whoever else you want to, but it's not a new concept that there are androgynous people. It was typically used more in a metaphorical sense, not in like a real sense. And uh, you know what I mean? It was obviously the female was a less rational side and whatnot that came with time. This is obviously different than what we know now and how we treat society, but that's just archetypically how it was uh, defined with the anima and the animus and throughout a lot of history. So it's not a new thing. And then we come into modern history and obviously Sigmund Freud, he publishes this book called... Uh, the three theories of sexuality, which largely is about transgenderism, and this kind of shake the world. It's, you know, that we aren't this, uh, that, well, theoretically, in his words, obviously, it's an extremely controversial book. But, um, it shake the world up of what gender and sex and sexuality became the president of most of psychology and actually largely founded psychology with the psychoanalysis as you know you've obviously all heard about the psychoanalysis of sexuality before and then we get into another case this is actually after him i believe it was uh, i'm gonna say early 1900s or late 1800s but john money he was a weird guy he essentially took two kids and raised them from birth but he raised them in the opposite gender and uh I can't remember if he castrated them or not. I believe he may have castrated the male. But essentially, he did that, right? And raised them in a different gender, made them wear clothes and whatnot, and, um, and published a book on it. And that's sort of the precursor for all of what our modern, uh, you know, transgender ideology is based on this guy. And these two children, obviously, one male and one female, did uh, end up killing themselves, which... Uh, it's a very sad story about, you know, these kids that got tortured and a lot of, like, there's tables on, like, their uh, semen output and weird, weird things. It's a very weird um, and disturbing, sorry, I'm quite literally cringing at this, that this is the background and the precedence for this uh, disorder. You know, it's almost perverted. It um, disgusts me. But I don't think that we should uh, classify what it is now from uh, where the studies largely started. Anyways, let's get into the literature. Again, it was 77 studies that I reviewed on PubMed. I searched up growth inhibitor, transgender. I want to see all the effects is what I'm primarily studying is a safety profile. Um, well, there are some studies on, um, you know, by, for example, Brendan Nolan, I'm going to go over and... Uh, some other ones by, uh, I don't know if I have it here on this paper. But anyways, I have it in order. So I have a lot of studies. Let's start diving into it. So David Hydusis in 2022, he studied 
um, sex hormone suppression and physical activity. So growth hormone inhibit inhibits uh, uh, the lack of physical activity in rats. So this is obviously a rat study. And uh, the growth hormone inhibitors obviously inhibit the growth hormone, which is in your uh, pituitary gland. So it's, uh, what do you call it? It's responsible for a lot of the growth, especially when you're younger, such as your bones and whatnot. But we'll dive into that later. So yeah, so it was uh, both in females and males, they had a marked difference. I believe it was about, from these numbers, it looks like it's twofold of what they were uh, outputting prior, which is, you know, that should be a consideration. But we also look at uh, the effects of the kids who are on growth inhibitors, and often, from studies, it says that they do get a tubby body build, and this might be one of the relations to it, you know? that if they're obviously not working out, they're going to get uh, fat, especially if they're not in the, you know, but that's also a concern with social media and all these other things, you know, but yeah, okay. So then I just want to talk about growth hormone deficiency too. So it's responsible for the development of bones and organs. It's a um, short stature. It, um, delayed maturation, um, it makes you younger looking face, and uh, chubby, chubby uh, body build. It's often due to pituitary dysfunction, so it is a natural thing that does occur, obviously growth hormone inhibitors, and it does cause, you know, stuff such as midget dwarfism, um, abnormal brain developments, and a bunch of other issues that we're going to try to go into, but the studies obviously are very limited, and there's not many of them. And then certain ones have, you know, coincidentally not been published that have been on the long-term effects. Especially when you look at the endocrine uh, system, which is a um, system of hormones, essentially neurotransmitters. It does get a, you know, it's of prime importance that we study the long-term effects. Because if you're constantly, like, you can, um, you know, take a bunch of dopamine and that's a lot different you know, you'll get the rush and the pleasure and whatnot, right? Because dopamine is primarily pleasure when it goes through uh, certain pathways. I believe it's the mesolimbic uh, pathway. Mesolimbic dopaminergic pathway. <laughs> but anyways, you know, but if you put it in, that's the D1 receptor is the D2 or for a whole other function. But it's also like for the excit excitation of muscles, which is just so cool. When you think about it if you didn't know about it before um but anyways i'm a geek for this stuff as you can tell but, um and another thing when you get an acute uh you know chronic acute um dopamine intake let's say i'm getting all doctoral on here when i really shouldn't be but you have too much dopamine in your body i believe it causes schizophrenia so yeah it does cause uh, schizophrenia it's related to adhd and a uh, bunch of other things it's um, obviously you got delusions, hallucinations, um, inhibitions of social activity, emotional range, and cognitive function. So that's dopamine. That's just an example of the long term effects when you have too much of it for a long period of time. And obviously, you can see other things with testosterone, and you know, everyone's heard of testosterone and um, estrogen, which, you know, an interesting thing about that. I'm obviously going on a bunch of side rants here, but this is a podcast, so bear with me. But you know, you need a balance of it. It's not like, oh, you can just increase your testosterone with all, oh, uh, and then you'll get like, you know, whatever the results are, more muscle, whatever you want, but you should also increase your estrogen a little bit because the balance is very good for you. If you want more uh, muscle and, you know, muscle growth, muscle uh, retention, whatever it is, whatever your sports goals are in that uh, thing, you also take less uh, damage. And then it's another thing, um, Take other things like creatine too, that will, uh, what do you call it? Cause less concussions, which is also very cool. But anyways, let's get back into it. So Janet and uh, Lee in 2023, they did uh, gonadotropin releasing hormone analogs. And they uh, did the SMR stages, which is a sexual uh, maturity rating. So again, four to five is about 12 to uh, 18 years old and it's about a uh, 20 it's in your 20s 25 for uh, males which is like you know the end of puberty to 
obviously. That's why there's a difference between 18 year olds and females and ev everyone's heard of this. So GnRHA results in a significant hypogonadal symptoms. So you get hot flashes, fatigue or decreased energy, increased um, irritability, you get weight gain, sexual dysfunction, um, I don't remember what I wrote here, but it's something genitory, God, I cannot read my writing sometimes, you get reduced libido, you get depressed mood, and you get difficulty sleeping, and uh, obviously that's because it affects your circadian rhythm, which is, you know, that's got to have some effects on your brain in neuroimaging studies, but not much has been done in neuroimaging studies after and before. Um, it also pauses breast development, which is one of the things that they want because they want the person to be androgynous. That's sort of the goal of growth inhibitors. So um, the alternatives are obviously menstrual suppression and uh, chest binding and um, hair removal or voice training. And um, in stages two to three, that's when um, we see the reduced um, height and the uh, reduction of the growth plate, which is a uh, early epiphyseal function, which uh, ages the growth plate. So the adult uh, bone mass is uh, largely altered by pubertal hormones during adolescence. There is a uh, higher rates of low bone density in the obviously growth inhibitor groups. Um, and then this small study couldn't find any neurodevelopmental um, differences in executive functions, so that's important. But they did find uh, changes in white and gray matter, which um, is one thing that's been correlated to uh, transgender youth. So, you know, they, you know, there's not many studies on this, but they think that um, transgenders might uh, be a cause of uh, differences in white gray matter because males and females obviously have different. Uh, amounts of gray and white matter and that's largely differences in executive functions and a bunch of different things that are very very small but it's also important to note that I don't think they found many um, difference of, differences between uh, females and males in terms of whatever they're who's better and who's worse and other than spatial visual spatial processing which appears to be far better in males, which I just think is kind of cool, but obviously we have, on the contrast, females are better at, um, you know, all the empathetic stuff. Males don't really uh, tend to that stuff well. It might be related to their, um, you know, reaction to oxytocin and vasopressin and a bunch of other things like that, which are the relationship hormones, for lack of a better word. So. We have a 2022, 2021 Clayton, it's a commentary article. And uh, there's a criticism of a study by Rev and uh, all in 2021. He messes up and conflates the correlations and causations. The suicide, suicidality is not a measurement of a adult suicide. or It's a measure of a how much you want to feel suicide and he conflates that in his thing he says uh, there's a positive outcome of adult suicidality with a uh, usage of youth pubertal blockers but you know this wasn't really study and it's messing up correlation and causation and they say that you can't really measure a causation here. First of all, all the studies that are done, they're not blind. So what they typically do is they put, um, you know, one group on a wait list and one group gets the drug and they measure the differences. And not only are there ideological differences, if you're telling someone, oh, you have cancer. Here, I'm going to give one person. Here, you know that this person, now you know that you're taking the drug and you know it's going to work. And then they can tell the other person, you're on a wait list. We're not giving, we're not giving them placebos. We're giving them blind. And then you know, there's certain uh, commentaries, I can't remember which article, but they argue that, hey, this is how it should be done. We shouldn't do, um, you know, blind studies. We shouldn't, what? 
we need blind studies. If it's not something that negatively affects the kids, we should be able to do blind studies. But obviously, that isn't being done, which is very scary um, on the efficacy. But they people argue that hey, even if the studies aren't, you know, being done or have been done on this, we should uh, still go on it because these kids are at risk of suicide. But also in this Rev et al. study, Clayton criticizes and says that there's a lack of use of all the literature. He says that, you know, it appears that um, Rev and his colleagues just missed a lot of the literature that's being used. The exposure is not reliable or valid. There's a conflation of facts. It's uh, not measured or um, mitigated. And it's uh, not of the entire U.S. population. And uh, then we go into a study by Tur Turbin et al. I didn't put the date for some reason, which is uh, very annoying. But the increased, uh, they found increased drug use, psychological distress, and alcohol use in um, transgender youth. And um, was not significant after uh, demographic variations were uh, accounted for and controlled for. There was a reverse causation, not uh, cause for suicidality. There was no measure of actual suicide in this study by Turbin at all. Then, um, this is um, Florence and Ashley in 2023. Furthermore, um, I think uh, Clayton also found that there was investment bias of researchers like a lot of the researchers are um, gay or transgender themselves and obviously they publish a lot of studies in this field so you know there's a bias of investment of these researchers that's notable sorry now let's get it back into Florence and Ashley in 2023 so they ban the use of hormone blockers due to lack of randomized control trials RCTs he argued that complementary and well-designed observational studies are far more reliable and more scientific than uh, randomized uh, controlled trials and should inform clinical policy making. So I can't remember where they banned this, but they banned ban this. It's obviously not in America and Canada and those countries, but they did ban it in one country for uh, children. And he's arguing that randomized controlled trials should be used, which is what I just talked about before. And um, no literature has been post posted on it. There was one study that um, I can't remember the name, but they did go into the long term effects. I believe it was a 24 month study, and they you know checked in every about six months, and it was supposed to be done by 2019. It's not published, even though then you know the same uh, person who was writing the article wrote another article that also didn't get published. It was supposed to be published, but maybe it'll be published eventually um it's also you know it's it's a I believe it's called the filing problem so whenever there's null hypoth or you know null results or results that aren't good they get put in the filing bin or perhaps they um, keep on doing more trials until they find a result that they um, desire or something that's significant which there's actually a journal um, called the I believe it's called the Journal of Null Hypotheses that addresses this issue because it's hard to get published if you, um, you know, come out with null hypotheses or hypothesis. Sorry, I don't know why I'm messing with that as that um, word. This is obviously a very long uh, thing, but yeah, it addresses that issue. And we get a uh, Ileana Scherher in uh, 2021 he says that transgender and gender diverse children and youth experience significant health disparities and adverse health outcomes. Pediatricians have an opportunity to improve these outcomes by practicing gender affirming care. And um, there's a lot of problems with this, you know, quote. You know, it's uh, saying that pediatricians basically ought to use these treatments. And um, 
gender affirming care, which is what they call it, which I think is also like a directional thing. You know what I mean? It's not necessarily, we know that these things have a negative effects on your body. It's not, you don't simply just pause your uh, growth hormones and you know, you don't grow. You, it does cause long-term effects. We have gone over that, but obviously there's not many studies on that. So let's go over Carlos Daniel and, uh, Guerra Castan in 2022. Sorry, that's actually one name. I did not end. It's a one very, very long name. I believe it's a Spanish study. Um, so I couldn't really read it fully, but I did get the abstract. So I believe he talks about uh, penile inversion vaginal plasticity, which is when you take your penis and you put it <laughs> inside to make a vagina. So when you take these growth uh, inhibitors, there's insufficiency in the penile skin due to either radical circumcision or puberty blockers presents great challenge to uh, vaginal reconstruction. So essentially you don't get the same penile skin that you would need in order to make the vagina. So when these kids were taking growth inhibitors, if they do want to go under uh, the more serious surgeries, let's call it that, where you go to obviously penile inversion, vaginal plasticity, you um you can't because you don't have enough uh, skin so it's another thing worth worth uh, noting if your you know kid is transgender and then um lee 2022 which uh came up with a study that fertility is not preserved if you are in a growth hormone there's some to in there's uh, some results to indicate that uh it can be reversed but you know these kids obviously aren't as fertile as before so they go over the trans feminine they require boys at first the uh, signs of puberty to masturbate to save sperm which i just think is disgusting in my opinion i don't think that we should be making any um pubertal boys masturbate for any almost anything i think that's gross in my opinion they uh found their semen volume and the concentration and uh motility is reduced the testicular volume falls um, with each year, and um, this is present in adults and children. The capacity will not develop if uh, they go eventually straight under um, to long-term care, which is obviously the vaginal plasticity and you know the whatever you want to call it when a girl turns her vagina into a dick somehow. <laughs> As uh, I'm sorry, these descriptions are crude. I don't know how else to describe it fully, but that, that is that is essentially what it is. Um, but along, obviously, if you go straight off growth inhibitors and you don't allow the time to regain, you will never um, regain a lot of the things that you uh, otherwise would have. So uh, then we go into surgical sperm uh, retention, SS or retrieval. Sorry. SSR, which is a, uh, you need anesthesia. It's done under anesthesia, which it's a surgery. So if you do take these growth inhibitors, what they have to do is they have to, you know, cut open your genitals in order to stimulate the uh, testicles to produce semen, which, you know, sounds terrible. I mean, that's, you know, any, any type of surgery causes especially of that degree causes a risk. It's a risk that should be accounted for and you know put into the literature more than it is, but it's not, which is why I'm making this video. Um, then we went to trans masculine uh, individuals. Those are obviously the individuals that transition into masculine or males or figures. Um, the ovary size and volume shape decrease, but might be reversible within your uh, other studies say it's uh, permanent. So it's not known. It's not known if it grows back with uh, the transition to long-term care. As obviously what happens to the males is obviously very different than what happens to the females. It's going to uh, boogers at all obviously in uh, 2023 I should stop saying obviously that's a makes my speech sound very um, you know 
pretentious and I don't mean to be like that. So I'm, I apologize for that. I need to actually work on that. Just realizing it now, when, you know, hearing myself talk for so long. So um, they found that the adult uh, bone is unaffected by GNRH analog. It's, uh, but it was, well, you know, 1.5 centimeters below, um, you know, the average at start. So that is a significant difference statistically, you know, 1.5 centimeters. But um, that's obviously an adult, so this isn't typically used for adults. So it's worth noting. And then let's go into Christina Olson, 2024. They did a study of uh, 220 people, and they found that nine were regretful of receiving treatment of uh, GNH, uh, sorry, GNRH. And um, which is four percent of the population that they studied, which I think is a significant number, even though they said it's not significant. That does seem significant, four percent. Um, I didn't do obviously the calculations, and I believe that is significant just by looking at it. Um, when I talk about significance, I can talk about the p value. I believe it, that four percent of the population is significant. I believe anyone would agree with me there. There's a Joanna Kennedy in 2019. So they did a 24 month study. This is the one I was talking about earlier. So they did 90, uh, 90 people on puberty blockers, 18 to 16 years old. They removed a lot of the pre existing conditions, such as um, visibi visibly distraught. They took out people who were suicidal, visibly distraught, um, homicidal, you know, psychotic symptoms. Um, active hallucinations and thought disorders or intoxication disorders, which is, um, you know, I think it's a large portion of the population that might be put on this. You know, if this is really causing the suicidal, you know, ideation, a bunch of other things, removing a lot of those people from the studies, you know, it doesn't really test the efficacy of this. But um, it's obviously still not published, even though it was supposed to be published in 2019. It's now 2024, that's five years after and um, they did do another study proposal maybe what it was but it seems like they were undergoing it it started I believe in 2016 so it should have been done by now but the results still aren't published so anyways that's um, my video that's going through all the literature on it obviously I'm not a physician I cannot tell you uh, what you should should not do I believe that you should consult with a physician and whatever legalities I need to say that for. But um, you should always look into with these things yourself to make your own judgments. Um, so in summary, based on this evidence, I believe that um, we have a lot of things to address, at least in this side of the literature. It appears that, first of all, growth hormone inhibitors from the studies do appear to be dangerous. This is supported by the evidence, which shows all these um, effects that I've gone over. And um, no studies have that have studied the thing have actually um, stated otherwise. So that's a major thing. And there's been no long-term studies, which is extremely dangerous considering this is being administered in a long-term fashion for months and even for years. And um, <clears throat> we did find negative effects. And furthermore, um, we need to look at the DSM criteria. It does seem a bit... Um, you know, vague and it can be easily misapplied, it doesn't seem reliable or um, valid. So, it's a few key areas that we need to address. Of course, we do need randomized uh, control trials. Hopefully, in the future, we will address all these issues. I want to thank everyone for um, listening to this. And again, you are free to make your own uh, choices and decisions and opinions on this. And if you disagree with me, of course, anyone can comment. They can make a video response. I'll put it in the description if anyone does. Just to, um, I want to, you know, encourage transparency. I want to encourage discourse. I think it's very important. And um, I will reply to any comment that goes below if you disagree with me. Thank you for listening.